the last time that we played, I believe everybody fell asleep in front of the fire. If I'm uh, if I'm remembering that correctly, yes, uh, in front of the fire in the tavern, yep. um, the Red Lamb Inn. What I remember of that is Desmond fell asleep in a chair. Andrus had a a bench which they had scattered straw over. How did <laughs> how did Aisha sleep last night? Because I know that everybody was talking, and there was the old lady who was sleeping in a chair off to the off in the corner. I think she would have just followed. Andrus's lead and just slept on the bench. Okay. Probably okay. where she was. Probably where she sat to eat dinner. Yeah, a bench would have would have been provided uh, from one of the innkeepers, like employees, his his little child servants that he has around. Tonight's story actually starts in a very interesting position for World of Darkness games. The early morning sunshine is coming through the fogged over windows. There's very chipper sounding birds outside who are singing their songs as they're greeting the sun for the first time. The three of you sleeping in very precarious uh, positions given the fact that you've opted not to use your beds. Um, could I start the game off? We're going to actually do a rouse check for the humans. Not rouse check as in rousing the blood, but rousing as in waking up. Um, and what I would like to see is a stamina plus composure as your rouse check this evening. Desmond with three successes. Desmond's got three. Thanks, forgot how to roll. <laughs> <laughs> Aisha has three I successes three as, as well. well. Somehow. One. one success. Um, so as the three of you start to, to rouse, probably from the sound of a, a gentle scraping along the stones, um, you open your eyes and adjust to the, the light coming in through the windows, the sound of the birds, the smell of last night's stew being reheated over a fire. You'll realize that scraping sound is one of the servants in the inn uh, sweeping the debris from last night's dinner uh, out the door. Andrus is going to wake up with a little bit of a stiff neck this morning uh, from the way that he slept. Um, not the most comfortable benches. That's for sure. Uh, you're just going to be down one trait for the evening due to, uh, due to uncomfort. The rest of the, um, oh, man, <laughs> sleeping's important. <laughs> what can I say? But, uh, it is over, uh, over the next half hour or so, the rest of the guests are going to be wandering down given effectively a sequel of last night's dinner uh maybe with a little bit larger of a hunk of bread a smaller portion of stew and probably a small bowl of homemade cheese of some kind um it's more liquidy than we would consider in the modern nights to be a good cheese. It's, it's very similar to what we have as cottage cheese nowadays. Uh, but that would be given along with some watered down wine um, for breakfast. How are the three of you starting your day? I would uh, get up and stretch, give out an exasperated groan. Well, not any worse than sleeping in a moving wagon. And then uh, sit down and uh, partake in some of the breakfast that's being offered while trying to wake up because coffee isn't here. I will uh, awaken and stretch while we take a look outside and listen to the birds singing. I thank both of the gentlemen for their pleasant company the previous night and uh, just dig into the food <laughs> and make sure that she looks presentable and make sure that the other ladies that she ate with the previous night also look presentable. She'll braid their hair and make sure they look at least a bit more prim and proper. Yeah, I remember you said that you were going to um, 
braid Mariana's hand, hair. And she is incredibly grateful for you to do that. How about Desmond? Uh, <clears throat> Desmond is... Yeah, Desmond's probably uh, up pretty early. Um, he doesn't... When he wakes up, he just sits in the chair and continues to kind of keep watch until other people start to stir. And then when they start to stir, he gets up and will walk over to the other... Like, to the corner of the room where he would have had the his uh, <clears throat> apprentices make a little spot in the floor, and he probably just kicks both their, their boots to wake them up. Get up, boys. Yeah, they'll... Uh, Not they'll, opinions to sit around and sleep all day. They'll get up, and when they look over and see the fact that the innkeeper is giving out food again, uh, they get hopeful looks in their eyes, a little greedy, very hopeful, and they look up at you for approval. He just nods, like kind of nudges his head, like, go on. Okay. Like hungry dogs, they rush over, they grab food, and uh, barely any human noises between them as they start to wolf down what's been given to them. Uh, and Desmond will... Uh, <laughs> He'll kind of, I think he kind of just watches as people wake up and start to stir and make their way toward toward the food. And then once once the women have, uh, once the like the, the the women who that he was kind of watching over and protecting the night before, mm -hmm. uh, once they've all kind of gotten up and stirred and started to get their <laughs> food and stuff, he'll he'll go and sit and have uh, have a tankard of wine and help himself to some bread. The wine is good. I want to point that out. Um, it is on its way out. It's it's almost got that little... It's got a very sweet taste at first, but it's got that vinegary aftertaste. You can tell that it's about to go down. Um, can I get a witch awareness from everybody? Wow. Okay. Dang. Jen coming in with... Five successes. All right. Yeah. Desmond with two. Jin. Uh, Desmond with two. Aisha with five. And Andres with uh, total failure. Zero. Um, Absolute total. I, I would think that Andres is just very happy to not be just sleeping on that hard bench any longer. And... It's also not very common to be able to wake up and just have breakfast prepared for you like this. Most of the time, especially I can see Andres, you travel around a lot. So anything other mm -hmm. than just a ripped piece of bread in the morning is, is a bit of a treat. So you're probably just focused on that. Um, Yep, he keeps taking swigs of the wine and swishing it around his mouth, trying to ascertain the uh, uh, extensive flavor of it. Trying not to show that he doesn't like the fact that it's almost completely vinegar. Mm -hmm. Desmond, on the other hand, um, you'll notice that off to one side um, is that man, Rodrigo. He's... He's eating, but he's more along just watching. Um, I think another thing that Desmond would probably realize is that that young soldier from last night, he hasn't come down yet. And then for... <clears throat> Yay. And then for Aisha... Um, You'll notice Rodrigo as well, but one thing that you'll pick up is that the old woman who is in the chair is also not there. The chair is there. The blanket she was wrapped up in is there. But her and her her little tin cup are gone. Uh, upon noticing this, Aisha will get up from her chair and just approach the barkeep to say, um, excuse me, I... I had a point I was going to give that old lady. Uh, where is she? 
Uh, Sigmund uh, was his name. Uh, Sigmund, the, the innkeeper. Uh, he'll look at you and he'll look over at the table and he gets kind of a, a far off look, almost like he forgets that you were talking to him. But uh, stares off in the direction where she was and then shakes out of it, which is kind of comical because he's a larger man. He has a very large uh, hanging mustache, which is, is very uh, common for the location. But when he, he goes to shake it off, it, it just kind of just jiggles in the ambience of his, uh, of his movements. And he looks at you and goes, oh, she, uh, she left before the sun came up. She, she's off to the nearest village to, to beg for whoever's going to be able to pay for her next meal. Oh, um, well, will she come back? Could you give this to her for me? And she'll hold out a small, like a, I don't know what the currency would be, but not, not an expensive coin, but, you know, just some change, basically. He, um, he takes it to, he takes it from you, but again, he has this, like, far off acknowledgement of what you're doing. Yeah. Like, he can't really comprehend why you're giving it to him. Uh, to give to her, uh, but he again, he'll he'll shake that off, and he'll be like, "Oh, oh yes, she'll be, uh, he'll she'll be back after after the sun goes down. She always is." That's good. She looks definitely relieved and just smiles at him and sits back down and begins eating again. He he smiles back and he probably watches you as you walk back to your seat. So. The group, everyone who's here, um, you're going to find yourself sitting around for quite some time, uh, enjoying the ambience of the, uh, of the inn itself. Um, some of the guests find themselves in conversation. Um, other ones have decided to go up and get dressed early uh, so that they can arrive at the Giovanni Mains, looking their best. Um, but for the most part, it's it's a pretty quiet day. Uh, you're actually going to find that um, until closer to late afternoon, you're not going to be leaving. So is there anything that you would do to pass the time? Yeah, Desmond... Does does the sold young soldier ever come back down? No, no, you didn't. You haven't seen him. Okay. Well, he would have probably started. Um, like, he would have went over to the trunk that that he arrived with, um, and begin to pull out uh, some of the spare pieces uh, that he that he was bringing yeah he brought some extra supplies um in case you know there was a, a situation where like you know obviously he brought some pieces to show off uh to lord giovanni but also would have brought some other uh materials just to see like in case that they wanted him to do something you know there um so he'll pull out some of the extra materials and he'll grab like some leather straps um and a couple of uh, pre-shaped like uh, not rods, but like I'm, I, I'm silent is blanking on the of what this would be called, but like the metal, like a metal um, strip okay. that he's already kind of hammered yeah, flat and level and square. Yeah, basically just um, something. To and he's show gonna start your technique. Yeah, um, and he's gonna start. Uh, he would like to kind of start playing around with the idea of like making something that would uh, support someone like uh, what he wouldn't know to call like a knee brace effectively. Like yeah. in his mind, he, uh, he has an image in his mind that he's trying to kind of create of like two metal, um, two metal long metal plates uh, with like a metal, uh, a circular metal plate at the bottom and then leather straps to like fasten around someone's leg to help them 
with walking. Yeah. Um, and so he's probably sitting, probably sitting off somewhere near like the fireplace or something and, uh, tinkering i imagine is what he's doing okay just basically seeing how things might fit together to see if they yeah he's just playing around with leg. playing around with ideas okay. yeah he's playing around with different uh different designs and, and measurements and he's uh he's probably pulled over like a small <clears throat> table that he's got some of this stuff set out on and he's just tinkering for the most part okay <laughs> But if that kid doesn't come down by like, you know, midday sun, he is, uh, he's probably going to get up and look for him. Um, after a little while, uh, he's, he is going to make his way down the stairs. He, it, it's, it's an awkward sight, but he uses the spear to basically put his weight on. Um, you'd probably hear him coming before you see him coming with a awkward thumping as he makes his way down the stairs. Um, you'll notice that he will be talking to Sigmund, the innkeeper, uh, before anything else. It, lo it looks like they have some kind of agreement. Um, and then Sigmund will pass him a, a bowl of stew with a piece of old bread just kind of plopped in the middle of it. Okay. He probably comes down about an hour or so after you all are awake and moving around. Okay. Um, when he would, he would kind of, he would be like eyeing the guy, you know, like kind of looking over with like leather straps in his hand, looking over, refastening a, you know, uh, kind of re readjusting the leather strap, looks back over at him, uh, kind of like he's measuring the guy's leg just by looking at it mm -hmm. uh, and continues to fidget. But once he gets kind of uh, to a point where he's almost done eating, Desmond's going to, boy, come here. Uh, he'll be a little shocked to hear you uh, talking to him directly, but he'll he'll make his way over to you. Uh, y yes, sir. Uh, just stand still. I, uh, and he's I, going to kind of dad grunt down onto a knee uh, and measure the, the outside of the guy's leg mm -hmm. uh, with a couple of leather straps and like not say anything about what he's doing. He's very clearly he's clearly doing it for a purpose, but he doesn't communicate this well. Yeah. Uh, and he just mm. and he, he <laughs> grabs one of the metal ro uh, plates and kind of sticks it to the side of the kid's leg. Now, the, now, while you're down there and you're trying to figure out how things are going to fit together with your craft, uh, can I get a wits plus medicine roll from you? Yeah. You certainly can. Yeah, who would have thought that was going to come Will up? it be good? Whole time will tell. <laughs> two successes. Two successes. It's two more than I expected to get. All right. As you're um, doing the measurements... And you can feel how off his leg feels as you're as you're trying to size him up. You can tell mm -hmm. that this was most likely an injury that would have killed most people. This is something where he would have been struck down, not helped, and just eventually died alone on the battlefield. This uh, he's a very lucky kid. He kind of looks up at the kid. He's uh, doing his best not to look down at you while you're working. He'll stand up, looking down at the kid. You're pretty timid for somebody as tough as you are. He uh, looks up at you and he's like, not not timid, just uh, trying to be respectful. Man. I think this will work. Give me some time. Yes, yes, sir. And he'll... Uh, best case scenario... I'll make something that will take the, enough pressure off of your leg, readjusting the weight from where your leg is damaged up to your hip, making it a little less painful to walk, maybe a little more sturdy. Worst case scenario, we may have to re-break your leg in order to properly adjust it for <laughs> long-term use. Look of we'll terror. That bridge when we come to it. <laughs> the look of terror that washes over his face. He actually breaks out in a little bit of a cold sweat. 
when when you say that uh, you might have to re-break his leg. Relax. Worst case scenario, I'm trying. To, my intention is to make you something that will assist in your walking without having to break your leg. Again. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah. Don't mention it. <laughs> He's gonna go back to tinkering. Okay. Um, Paul, keeping out, <laughs> keeping an eye out from the side of uh, yeah. of that guy. I forget his name. The the creep, one of the guys that came with the creepy guy the night before. Rodrigo. Rodrigo, thank you. Yeah, Rodrigo is the coach master, and uh, it's funny that you say that because after Paul, the soldier, is done speaking with you, he makes his way over and sits at the same table as Rodrigo, who uh, at first looks slightly annoyed that he's coming to sit with him, but he will engage him in what appears to be pleasant conversation. Yep, I'm just going to give them the occasional side eye as I'm keeping an eye on them. Yeah, they seem to just be having a, an amicable conversation. They're, they're having a, a back and forth. Paul seems to be doing most of the talking, but you might actually catch Rodrigo okay. laugh a little bit at what appears to be from across the room appropriate times. They, they seem to be having a pleasant conversation. I will, uh, or Andrus will, um, finish his meal and he will spend a lot of his time just trying to make himself look presentable, smell presentable, go to his meager carts of wares and uh, pick out something, one of the best items he probably has to uh, present as a gift and just kind of getting himself prepared for the eventual meeting. Okay. Out of curiosity, what would Andrus give as a gift to Lord Giovanni? He would probably... It depends on what, what does Andrus know about Giovanni's taste specifically. Okay. Uh, we'll tell you what. Let's what go would, ahead and what do... Would he... um, let's go what ahead he... and do an intelligence plus etiquette roll and see if uh, there's anything that you may have picked up in your travels something that you may have uh, learned about Lord Giovanni. Alrighty. And I'm still a trait down, correct? You are, because you're uncomfortable. Uh, that'll be in physical tests. So don't worry about being a trait down right oh. now. One success. I'm going to go ahead and say that you have some basic information about the Giovanni themselves. Um that Giovanni, the family, has been a pretty big name for quite some time. Uh, originally uh, being known as, as a merchant family that has effectively made it big. They, they, they found a way to, to rise above their social status, uh, which, which seemed to be significant as it is, but now the name can be heard almost anywhere in Europe. Um, so you would know that at least they probably have more Italian tastes than anything else. Okay, I will pull out probably a very, uh, very nice bottle of wine. Probably the finest bottle of wine that I probably have in my possession. Hmm. Uh, quality of which I leave up to you. Um, and I'll, I'll present that. Okay. We'll go ahead and say that you have a, a fairly uh, a fairly well-off bottle of wine. I assume that since you travel a lot, you'd probably end up having... Like, y your resources are considerable. And you do have some yes. fairly... Um, you do have some fairly good contacts as well. So I would, defi I would definitely say that you probably have a... a a good vintage to present to Lord Giovanni. Awesome. Sounds good. And I'll, I'll get that ready and get myself nice and presentable and then uh, probably lounge around and wait. Alright. How about Aishi? 
Aisha would, uh, after finishing her meal, probably just try to get to know the ladies that she's with a little bit. Uh, maybe share a bit of gossip from the town that she's currently staying in uh, before she came to the inn. Uh, and just generally helping them with things like yeah, table manners, posture, how to curtsy, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, she is kind of just rolling with the punches with something. I'm guessing what the etiquette would be, but just trying to make sure that they the right foot if possible most of the young women who are there who are quite young um, probably in their late teens uh, maybe a couple in their early 20s uh, Mariana herself who you just finished uh, doing her hair uh, is 18 years old um, they all have peasant uh, peasant etiquette for the most part um, I think probably one of the Older women might be a little bit more better off, a higher status. But most of the girls seem to be just girls that don't have formal training, but aren't they're they're not pigs either. They're not they're not just like diving into the food and being messy or anything. They're trying very hard to duplicate what they see around them. How many uh, out of, out of curiosity? How many uh, how many of the girls' hair would you be willing to do because I that would be a laborious activity. If it's clear that they're gonna have to wait for quite a while, she'd be happy to do all of them. Oh, okay. Because once you offer, they are gonna start lining up, um, and you are gonna find that a lot of them, <laughs> a lot of them, the the, a lot of them are not the cleanest. Like it's they've washed their hands, they've washed their faces. That is the most presentable that they have work themselves out to being but like some of these girls have not taken their hair down for it appears years in some cases um so it is something that would take you quite a long time to try to make them at least presentable yeah it should definitely take the time i think uh giving them a hand and just sort of talking with them is probably going to help calm their nerves, but it's also going to help calm her nerves as well. Okay. So she'd be happy to do that. All right. So we are probably looking at, as I said, a few hours of this type of uh, time being spent, <laughs> just being left to your own devices to interact with those around you. Um, and then... Uh, after some time, some, several, several hours, um, I would say that it's probably getting close to around 3 o'clock in the afternoon or so. Uh, you are going to hear the sound of another carriage beginning to pull up. And when it comes into uh, an audible range, Rodrigo is going to end up getting up and stepping outside, leaving the guests, uh, leaving the guests unchaperoned, I guess you could say. If there's a window that Desmond could maybe look out to see what's going on, mm -hmm. he would uh, uh, slide over and just peer out the window. Okay. Um, a very large, fancy black carriage has just pulled up. This thing looks just completely built for luxury from what you can see. As soon as that one parks and the driver hops down, shakes hands with Rodrigo, um, another one, almost identical to it, gets pulled out of the barn so that there's two large, identical uh, carriages. Um, you can probably assume that this is the one that Rodrigo drove over last night. They seem to just be having a uh, warm conversation of greeting. Um, there seems to be a little bit of a accounting happening. Um, 
where Rodrigo seems to be ahead of the game on understanding what numbers actually mean. Uh, but there is one thing. Uh, is Who all is looking out at the, at the carriages during this time? Because the, the windows are quite prominent. They are letting a lot of light in. You can see outside. Um, I'm, I'm assuming Andrus would take a peek outside once he hears the carriages outside. I sure would, too. Okay. Uh, the other guests, there's, there's going to be a lot of them who are quite nosy at this situation as well. It's not odd that people are watching. Um, but if I could get a wits and awareness from you all uh, as you look at the carriages. Four successes. I'm seeing that. That's one with three. Two successes. Two successes. Okay. I would say that Aisha doesn't really notice much about it, possibly because they're just so grand. They're so opulent. They have... Uh, they're, they're very dark. They're, they're black carriages, but they all seem to have um, a lot of finery attached. There's a, there's a big gilded G uh, on the side of the door uh, the, which is the symbol for, for the Giovanni family. Um, Desmond's going to notice something primarily due to his profession. Um, but uh, Andres is going to notice something. He's going to notice the exact same thing. Is that the, the windows of this carriage, they have these massive shutters over them. These just big heavy wooden shutters with these massive uh, hinges, these big iron hinges, which is probably what Desmond would notice first is the hinge, the hinges. Is it good? Is it good craftsmanship? Oh yeah, no, it's, it's the finest that you've seen. Yeah, it's, it's very well made. <laughs> Knowing Desmond, he's probably studying the technique before he acknowledges how weird it is. Okay. <laughs> Those are very large shutters for a carriage. Hmm? Oh. Oh, I suppose you're right. Yes. I mean, coverage on a carriage such as this isn't own, but normally it'd be some sort of fabric to let the breeze in, otherwise it would become stifling within them. I wonder if this is meant more for transportation of cargo than it is for people. Uh, nobles don't want light to fade their cloth, maybe? I don't, I don't know. No, no, that's that's very true. Nobles have a very eclectic tastes. They don't want the sun to parch their skin and turn it leathery and rough as if ends of somebody who works for a living, such as you. <laughs> the carriages are nice, however. Lacquered and pitch black. Stands out. So I'm surprised they'd be willing to put in a gilded anything on there. Bandits would definitely try to take that. Yeah. Either way, at least we'll be traveling in supposed luxury. As you guys are talking, um, Rodrigo is going to make his way back into the inn. And uh, he looks... This is... I, I do want to point out that this <coughs> is not odd for someone who has some title and rank to speak to underlings, even if they are not under his employ uh, in the manner that he does. But he's going to walk in and look at Desmond's apprentices and uh, effectively order them to start putting the, the luggage and stuff on the two carts. Does that bother Desmond at all, that uh, his... Uh, Apprentices are being given orders. No, I don't think it bothers him. I think he just keeps a very close eye on them. Yeah, I th I think he just keeps a close eye on them, not to uh, to 
to first of all for their safety is like his first concern, but secondly to make sure that they don't scuff the carriages, uh, or if they like are goofing around and drop somebody's belongings, he can like whistle out the window at them to tell them, you know to, to deliver the uh, the meaning of sh like shape up yeah. <laughs> right now, you know. So you're basically. Uh, but I, just, I don't think it bothers him any now. You're basically just coordinating the order at that point. I mean, if it's it's pretty common, right, for people of station to to give order to other serve like serfs and apprentices, right? It, it would be yes. Okay, then he probably wouldn't have too much of an issue with it. Like I said, he just he watches to make sure that they're not being mistreated yeah. and that they're not mishandling anything that they're that they're carrying. Well, he uh, <laughs> he's not mean, and he would have told them before they got here. Like if somebody tells. Yeah, he and he they would have been told before we got here like if someone tells you to someone of station tells you to do something just do it. Don't don't second guess or question their authority. Just do it and if it's if it's not something that you should do, I'll step in and handle it. Okay. Uh Rodrigo like I was saying, so, he's, he's not mean. Cuz he doesn't not, he doesn't want them he doesn't want them offending someone. Yeah. Um, like I was, uh, Rodrigo's not rude. He's not mean to them. He'll actually, um, he'll actually toss a coin to each of them, which they get massively excited over. And they kind of, again, they look to you for approval. Is it okay if we keep this? Um, he just nods. And, uh, they will start doing what they were told by Rodrigo. The other man who's outside will tell them where each of the parcels of luggage go. Uh, none of them are going inside the carriages. They're going on the back or on the roof of the carriages. Um, Rodrigo, however, he will... When he walks in, he claps his hands to get everybody's attention. He goes, All right, please listen to me. Uh, we will be leaving shortly. Uh, those of you who brought uh, servants... Of any kind, uh, the servants will be staying here until after the dinner, where you can reclaim them. Are there any questions? If my apprentices are part of it, any uh, displays for the Lord Giovanni, I'm, a smith certainly doesn't put the armor on himself. He'll uh, nod in understanding. Kind of makes an appraising look. And he goes, uh, he looks at all of you and then looks over to the carts. He's like, all of you have to fit within these two carts. That The, the more uh, station high members of the group kind of get this look of, you're fucking kidding, right? Like, it, you're going to cram us all in that thing? I do not I believe that we'll have room. Shotgun. You call shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> if there is if there is a dark age equivalent to calling shotgun <laughs> due to the fact that shotguns Andres don't exist it. yet. <laughs> I re I request to sit up in the front in the forward carriage. Hmm. <clears throat> it is quite a long ride. You might be more comfortable in the carriages themselves. Would I? He, it's he all just wooden looks benches, at you as a he looks at you with a confused <laughs> with a confused look on his face. No, it's uh very comfortable inside. He goes over and he opens up one of the doors and he, he notices that like the carriages have their shutters over their windows, and he uh, he instantly starts to undo them, make sure they're open, light can get in, air can get in. Uh, but he, he opens it up, and they're incredibly large, very uh, plush cushioned seatings. Um, it looks like there's uh, enough uh, space in the windows for a good breeze mm. to come through. So these carriages are made to transport people. Oh, Why yes. are these shutters so uh, 
What's the word? A lot. Their uh, protection in case of brigand attack. We shouldn't have any problem with that. Ah, so... I see, I see. Very well, very well. Lord Giovanni is... When uh, will we be leaving? Uh, as soon as everybody is ready to go and the luggage is all packed up. Now, if you are showing goods to Lord Giovanni and you need someone for display, we can definitely provide that. There are servants at the mains. I have but one item that I will be carrying with me until we arrive. Is it sizable, or are you just Desmond carrying it on yourself? Will... Oh, what did he say? I said, "Is it uh, is it sizable, or are you carrying it on your on your person?" I carry it on my person. Here's the bottle. He looks at you. A mere bottle of wine. He looks at you and he nods. He smiles. He's like, I'm sure that will be appreciated. I hope so. Cost me a small fortune. <laughs> did uh, did Desmond have something to add to this? Uh, he Desmond just looks angry. Okay. You can, and he's grumbling to himself like, like, I've already did the measurements and the fitted for the display on... You know, and he's just rambling to himself. Uh, I'm gonna, it's going to take me, like... It's going to take me forever to get it readjusted. Yeah, he's just grumbling to himself uh, yeah. while he's uh, going to find the two boys and tell them that they'll be staying here. Okay. But one of the one of the kids that he has with him is old, closer to, like, 15. The other one's probably closer to, t like, 12. Mm -hmm. um, so he, the, the 15-year-old being closer to, uh, effectively, a full-sized person uh, is the one who is going to do the like model the armor for him so he's going he'll he'll just begrudgingly <laughs> walk off and tell them that they're staying here and to behave <laughs> rodrigo will actually kind of like do that little hurried run towards you and um he will put a acknowledging hand on your shoulder and i, I promise we will have someone who is of the appropriate stature so you can show your goods to uh, Master Giovanni. I, I, we, we are not trying to go for any type of uh, discomfort in this. It's, it's a trip for pleasure. Gritting his teeth, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And how is uh, how's Aisha handling all of this? I was muted. Uh, she's just watching on and trying not to uh, draw too much attention to herself, but this conversation is a bit comical, so she does stifle a bit of a laugh. Okay. <laughs> Are you making any uh, special preparations with all of this? Uh, no, she's just arrived with herself and some belongings, uh, but she doesn't have any gifts. So maybe she feels a little bit guilty about that, but she doesn't have much money to give. Yeah. Um, once all of the logistics are handled, Rodrigo will uh, take a second to look over all of the guests. And when he gets to the girls that you've had time, that, that Aisha has had, has had time to uh, do their hair make them up a little bit more. He um, He's almost taken aback. Like, he knew what you were doing. He watched you as you were braiding the hair in the restaurant. But seeing the final outcome, it's... He looks, at first, kind of um, kind of happy about it. But then he, he gets almost a... Kind of a saddened look in his eyes when he, when he looks over all the guests. But he that is will mildly uh, concerning. That is mildly concerning. Uh, he will uh, he will begin to start ushering everyone towards the uh, towards the carriages, which I will be putting 
the three of you in one carriage for conversation purposes, uh, as well as a few other, um, a, f a few of the other guests. Uh, we'll go ahead and say in your carriage, we're going to go ahead and say Mariana is in there, and so is Gustavo, which I know everybody enjoyed his company last night. So... <laughs> <laughs> Gustavo again Gustavo was the man who was sitting with the women and seemed to not understand what personal boundaries were oh everyone's favorite dinner guest yeah that guy <laughs> uh, we'll also say that there is an older woman um, who is sitting there uh, and I will just say that she is going to fall asleep within five minutes after hitting the road Good for her. So you all, I wish her the best of luck because for the first five minutes of the drive, it's just is just Desmond just grumbling. That your <laughs> most, he's just so frightened over that one particular detail. Desmond's attitude mm. towards this uh, towards this trip is probably the reason she has decided to take a nap. <laughs> She's probably actively trying to avoid you. <laughs> so are we like, just how do you expect a smith to show off his wares in the best way possible if we're changing his plan halfway through? It's ridiculous. You know, he's just <laughs> rambling to himself. Uh, <laughs> I didn't make the armor for some nobody to wear. I made it for him to wear, you know. So we'll go ahead and say <laughs> that in this extra wide cart, uh, there are two bench seats, which again are very, uh, very comfortable. They're very um, cushiony. Um, and we'll say three, three seating on one and three seating on the other. Six people in this cart total. Um, given the time period, we're probably going to go ahead and say that the men are sharing one bench, the women are sharing another, um, and then you are going to go. Uh, Rodrigo would be the driver that you have, and it he goes out of his way to make sure that your ride is exceedingly comfortable, which he tells you as you're getting into the cars. You'll notice that when there are rough patches of the road, he does slow down. He is very avoidant over anything that's going to make this a... Um, an uncomfortable ride at all. So, we're looking at, most likely, a three and a half to four hour carriage ride. That's gotta be annoying, no matter how comfortable the carriage is. How would you all spend that time? Well, I actually would spend a good amount of time just looking at all the intricacies of the, the detail, the upholstery, and just... I think some of her thoughts just are said out loud, and she just says, This is so beautiful. <laughs> I mean, does he live in a castle, do you think? He definitely did not spare any expense with carriages. The, uh, the cushioning on the benches oh, are are very overstuffed, fine, soft leather. The uh, stitching that holds everything together is golden. And um, since uh, Aisha is is spending a good amount of time probably running her hands over the leather, seeing how the stitching, uh, the designs and everything, you will notice that there are tiny little buttons that sink into the cushion periodically um, that are in the shape of little black skulls. Well, he certainly has uh, an interesting <laughs> taste. Uh, lots of black and gold and skulls. Yes, I've heard Giovanni had the very eccentric Liberties. 
they are a merchant family, right? That skulls? Yes, they are a merchant family. Could not tell you why skulls seem to be a theme, but death is something that uh, can pique the interest of a great many people. Oh. Gu Gustavo is leaning back. Kind of shuffles in a seat a little bit. <laughs> Gustavo is is leaning back. I'm going to go ahead and say that he's sitting directly across from Aisha. And he's kind of sleeping. He has this overstuffed hat with with a, a, a large feather that just kind of just falls off to one side, probably annoying who's ever sitting next to him. Uh, <laughs> either either Desmond. Uh, where, where do you think Desmond or... Um, or Andros would be sitting. Who who would take the middle? Definitely not Desmond. <laughs> He's probably the biggest, most well-fed guy in this carriage. To be fair, uh, I would he, the he would probably end up being in the middle. Okay. I, Andros would be by the window for sure. Okay, we'll put Gustavo near the window. But he's annoying both of us. <laughs> and uh, where would um where would Aisha sit? Uh, yeah, she'd sit in the middle. That's she'd sit fine. in the middle? Okay. So directly across from Gustavo, he probably would appear to be asleep at first as well. He's got his hat kind of tipped down over his eyes. And, uh, he, um, he kind of chuckles. You might actually think that he's laughing in his sleep at first. But, uh, as you guys are talking about what kind of people these Giovanni might be, he, uh, he, he just kind of laughs and goes, <laughs> the, the rumors abound about the family Giovanni. Oh? He, uh, rumors, you say? He'll, well, he'll lean forward. Share them, then. <laughs> he leans forward and he puts his hat up. He gets this, this conspiratorial look on his face. He looks over and sees the old lady is asleep, or at least faking to be. <clears throat> uh, Mariana looks out the, out the window and, and tries not to listen to the gossip that's happening in front of her. And uh, he said, yes, the uh, the way they keep the money in the family, where their, man where their money comes from. So many interesting stories coming out of uh, via Venice. Do tell. Well, let's see. Let's build it. I have heard that they have been gaining power and strength in their trade commodities since Rome. Uh, let's see. I have heard that... Uh, and he he looks back behind him as if he's going to see through the carriage and at Rodrigo, who's only a foot or so away on top of the cart steering. And uh, leans back in and says... I hear they exclusively only marry their own women. And uh, kind of breaks out in a big smile and starts laughing at that. That's blasphemous. <laughs> Where's the priest when you need him? <laughs> I think they beat him up and left him in the bar. Oh, it's a shame. I was hoping for a uh, send-off. What other great be. evils? Ah, they keep it in the family. Gross. Well, that is only a rumor. Ah, rumors. Yes, rumors. I also well, hear that they, they have a tendency to... Then would you have come along? Hmm. I'm not about to turn down an invitation from Claudius Giovanni. I think it might be more dangerous to offend him oh, by not showing up. Would you? Mm -hmm. Would you turn, turn him down? down? Yes, would you? I'm sitting here, am I not? Exactly, but if you knew the rumors, would you have turned him down? No. 
I would have not. Exactly. The rich can do as they want because they can pay off even God. Hmm. Yes. That is something, isn't it? Gold goes a long way, even in the face of religion. Indeed it does. And he, like, pulls out a gold coin and kind of, like, shuffles it around his fingers. Tell me, what do you have to offer Lord Giovanni? What do I have to offer Lord Giovanni? Well, and he, he looks over and he winks at Aisha. And, uh, well, I think I might be paying off a debt for someone. I'm not 100% sure, but I know a lot of scoundrels. Oh, I see. So you're pay paying him any information? Possibly. I do have a lot of information to give. Wonderful. I know our Desmond over here is presenting him with some fashionable piece of armor. Well, maybe if you're such a bad man, come through friends, then maybe he'll take your head. <laughs> he, uh, he smiles at that. And, um, he's going to get himself back in his comfortable position and uh, pull his pull his hat back over his hat back over his eyes and I may be a bad man but I am a popular man what about you Aisha do you have anything to present Lord Giovanni I have my presents that's about all that I can offer to be honest oh what are these presents uh, no, it's in my presence. Like oh, your presence. Oh, excuse sure me. Yes. <laughs> Forgive me. Well, as elegant as your presence may be, he might be a little bit disappointed if he did not have something to give him. Yes, I uh, I fear that, but I will handle that when it comes to it. Well, I I will help you here. At the very least, you can give him these gold coins. I'll offer her some of uh, some of the money that I have with me to make a presentable offering. What good is more gold to one of the wealthiest men in the world? It isn't the material value that is important. It is the fact that someone of her station would present something so valuable to them in reverence to Lord Giovanni that would strike his fancy, if you know what I mean. How many coins do you give her? Are you sure I can take this? Um... Let's say... I don't know. What, what, would, be a, what would be a sizable amount that would be impressive? I mean, gold coins are going to be impressive One regardless. One resource dice? One resource dice worth? Um, yeah. I think that would be quite a bit. Like, you might just be handing her a, a small pouch at that point. Hmm. How about just, uh... How about just five? Five? Five gold. Yeah. I so think that would be a, a pretty impressive amount for... So Aisha is handed five gold coins. She does take them, but the, uh, there is definitely hesitation there. Um, oh, don't I worry, my dear. You can take these. And you can just consider it a favor for later on. Uh, yes. Should, should, we ever, should we ever see each other again? Never know what the road of destiny will lead us to. What, is, what does five gold uh, coins mean to Aisha? Uh, five gold coins means a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Aisha is attempting to amass a pool of savings so that she can move somewhere and buy for herself properly. And uh, five gold coins would go a long way. So she's basically holding a, a decent sum in her hand right now. Yeah. How does um, 
How does Andres hand them to her? Does he drop the coins? Like, let them fall and clang? Or do you just... Oh, no. He, he uh, pulls out, like, a piece of parchment or cloth um, and takes the, his pouch, puts them in the cloth, and wraps them uh, tightly and then hands them to her. Okay. How much rattling do you think there would be? Rattling? Yeah. Like the how coins? much? How much? Probably jingling? a lot, considering we're a carriage and there's no. Um, I mean, it, it would be enough that people in the carriage would be able to hear the jingling for sure. The only reason I ask nice is because mouth. the only reason I ask is because when you hand the coins over to Aisha and they jingle a little bit, the last thing that Gustavo is going mm. to say without provocation, unless anybody speaks to him outright is knowing the Giovanni they'll only need two one for each eye well I know what he's referencing here <laughs> um I will happily out of game I will uh, ha I will happily allow anybody to roll an intelligence plus either academics or occult whichever you have that is higher Andres, with your two successes in that role, you're going to know that has that has something to do with some type of funerary rite. But the details on mm. it are a little foggy. As, as I thought. That's a very foreboding thing to say there, Gustav. <laughs> He just chuckles. Now, as I had said... Have to explain why? Ah. Shall I explain why? <laughs> just rumors. Indeed. Just rumors. I hear that the Giovanni have, uh... Interests... That are a little bit more morbid than most people. And the idea of, uh... Giving someone I coins... See. To pay the ferryman might uh, blend well with that family. Hmm. Strange and mysterious indeed. <laughs> I will be most pleased to uncover the truth of this. Perhaps instead of this bottle of wine, I should have brought one of the preserved cultish items that I possess. <laughs> so the um, the the ride is quite long. Um, if you would like to play out more just with talking to each other, I will definitely allow that. Uh, if not, uh, I do have one wits and awareness test that needs to be thrown by everyone, uh, and then we can arrive at Casa Giovanni. We get two successes from everyone. Who's all around? Interesting. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, um, given that's a common... You know, it, it seems to be the common role for that. I'm going to go ahead and allow people to see. Um, when you start approaching the uh, the actual men's itself, and you get into a thicker part of the woods, I'm going to go ahead and say that Mariana sees it first, and she points it back. Gustavo and the and the older woman is they're both asleep. They don't notice, but she will point out that there are three bodies crucified to trees in the woods as you're passing by. Oh, well that's definitely morbid. Shield your eyes, young Desmond. You you should not see this. <laughs> young Desmond? How old is Desmond? <laughs> in his 40s, like mid to late 40s. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said that definitely with a pinch of uh, uh, a pinch of humor to it to kind of lighten the mood. And you and you def and you definitely do. This one's like, I'm neither nor innocent. I've seen worse. Like he doesn't get the joke. <laughs> Fair enough. It's a perfectly good waste of meals. Oh, there are far more fish to kill someone. That's not about efficiency, it's about sending, right? Putting them out there in the open to be displayed, 
They've obviously done something to upset me. And they want to make sure everyone knows what happens to those who upset the Giovanni. At least that's what I think. What about you, Gus? You, uh, you talk, you're talking to Gustav? Gustavo? Yeah. Okay. Um, as I said, he was, as yep. he's asleep. Are you, are you waking him? Yeah. Yeah. I remove, I, I like move his hat. <laughs> he, uh, he startles oh, awake. He startles awake for a second. He's like, are we, are, have we arrived? Oh, but look at this interesting sight out there. He, uh, he, he looks out the window just in time to just see them move out of sight, and he's, uh, he, his, his eyes get kind of wide, and, uh, he kind of sticks his head out the window to see what's going on. Kind of, kind of uncomfortable for probably everybody in the cart, due to the fact that there's six people in here. Uh, and he stands up, he's in the middle. Um, well, that's, uh, that's not a good sign. You're the one who started talking about rumors of morbidity. <laughs> I didn't say I was surprised. I said it was not a good sign. Yeah, true enough. Would you like some coins to shield your eyes from the horrible? <laughs> I am I am fine, my friend. Thank you. I do appreciate it, though. But I am not one to accept handouts. I see. You are above charity. I think he'd probably just wink Fair at you after that. <laughs> There's something wrong with your eye? <laughs> not at all. I would say... Well, I guess, I guess we all... Not to do anything... You know. <laughs> they, uh... Gustavo would actually probably laugh at that and say, oh, they probably just tried to avoid paying rent or something. The uh, the travel um, is going to come to a halt shortly after that. I would say probably about 15 minutes or so after you see the bodies hanging in the woods and you're going to start coming to Lord Giovanni's mains just as the last blazes of sunlight are disappearing over the distant mountains. The house seems very well fortified. If you look out the windows at all, you can definitely see details of it. It has a single stout door, very narrow windows on the bottom floor that are all protected by inner shutters. One of the strange things, though, is that as you're passing by, to the right, there seems to be a very large, overgrown garden. And on the left is a fairly filled-out graveyard. Other than that, there are some soldiers who are keeping watch on the parapets who will allow you all in. And then, as you find yourselves in this courtyard, in front of the large wooden door that leads inside the mains, it's just all of the guests are starting to, to pile out into uh, into the actual grounds now. Andrus will take this opportunity to get out of the stuffed sardine can of carriage. Stretch his legs and take a nice breath of uh, fresh air. <laughs> Well, fresh air is one way to say it. It's almost like breathing in swamp air out here. It's not overly hot, but it is takes a kind of stale. Nice deep breath. Uh, he takes a deep breath, and then he coughs a little bit, and he's like, well, better than nothing. <laughs> and he offers the his hand to assist uh, the ladies out of the carriage. I shall definitely take the help, but she'll wake up the older lady as well. She, um... She, she starts to wake up. She's kind of uh, confused where she is at first, and when she looks out the window, uh, she sees the... 
she sees the set, the the graveyard out first, and she she seems a little taken aback. She's like, oh oh <laughs> oh, and then she sees the massive house and is yeah. just lost in the sheer size of it all. Welcome to the Giovanni's Manse. Indeed. So why, you, why you would put a graveyard right in the front courtyard seems rather strange, but uh, is everybody moving into the... Uh, after everybody gets the out of the carriages, um, there's a, a soldier who comes up who's who's mildly armed. He has a pole arm. Uh, it might be more decorative than anything else, but let's see... Um, I think Desmond might be able to tell more than anyone. If you want to do a uh, intelligence plus crafts roll uh, for Desmond, you might be able to tell exactly how fortified these soldiers might be. Uh, would my specialty apply in this situation? Your specialty? Let's see. Yes, yes it would. Three successes? You can tell that the soldiers who are guarding are not just showing off. It's not just peacocking. They are armed with battle-ready weaponry uh, that is meant for protection. Okay. He's, uh, he'll definitely take note of that. So, a soldier opens the massive oaken door and Rodrigo leads all 13 of the guests into the mansion. As you enter a very long, narrow hallway that are all lit by taper candles that are ensconced in these iron cage-like housings. The candles provide almost no light whatsoever. It kind of just makes things more confusing with how long the shadows are and the flickering. The, uh, the soldier is going to remain at the door, however, when you all walk in and shut and lock everything behind you as Rodrigo and the characters go forward into... Uh, into the, the dim light of the actual mains itself. Rodrigo is going to lead you all into a hall. And as you're walking through this hall, you can see that there are actually arrow slits on both sides of the inside of this building. As if they're waiting to attack people who are already past the gates. There's also very demonic gargoyle faces that are built into the wall that you could swear are just moving and leering at you as you walk past. At the end of the Andrews hallway... Andrews will give them a hmm? nod and a wave. You nod and wave at the, at the gargoyles? Andrews will give them a nod and a wave. Okay. Uh, at the end of the long hallway you'll all find yourselves facing another very stout door. And Rodrigo pauses at the door and bangs on it incredibly loud. The door does not open. Most of the guests are just kind of standing there waiting for something to happen, but there's no response. After a couple of seconds, Rodrigo will bang again. Again. No response. How do you all handle the claustrophobic situation that you find yourselves in? Because you're all stuck in this hallway with all of these people and seeming no exit that's coming through. she is doing her best to keep it together but I think she if she's anywhere near Mariana she will reach for, like, for her hand and just like take it and squeeze it <laughs> as she looks around did we have to bring in our own stuff like our did, would Desmond have been able to bring his trunk with him or would would they have left that on the carriage and someone deliver that someone will be bringing them in for you Okay, um, in that case then, uh, Desmond is going to move to kind of, try to kind of position himself where he can get his sword out of his sheath if for 
something bad happens because it just does not have good feelings about this. Oh, well, when was the last time everyone here has been this unsettled? <laughs> For me, it was a uh, about a year ago. Gustavo is gonna look over to you, uh, <laughs> Andres, when he says that. And, uh, what what happened a year ago? I just found myself into some unsavory circumstances dealing uh, with some not so upstanding businessmen. Mm. So, how stealthy is Desmond being drawing his sword in this tight place? <laughs> oh, he's not drawing his sword. He's just trying to position himself in a place where if for some reason he has to draw it, he can do so without hitting someone that he doesn't intend to hit. Ah, uh, okay. So you're just trying to gain some space? Like, like he's move, moving, he's, yeah, he's trying to kind of wiggle into a spot where he has room, and then he just rests his, ha his hand on the hilt of his sword. Okay. Understood. Nothing dangerous seems to be happening. People just seem to be getting a little bit uncomfortable in the tight quarters that you're in. No one really seems to be answering the door that Rodrigo banged on. And there doesn't really seem to be anywhere to really go. There's no furnishing in this hall. It's just... It's just a passageway from one room to the other. Perhaps you should try again. Rodrigo will, uh... Look back over at Andrus when he says that. And kind of has this this uh please don't blame me look on his face <laughs> how is i just I gesture to the door like oh. <laughs> how how is aishi handling the uh the claustrophobic accommodations at the moment not well um <laughs> there is no exit so uh the anxiety is definitely high hmm. but she's just trying to keep it together on the outside and Meltdown on the inside, I think. Yeah, the the exit behind you, where you where you all came in, is guarded by a soldier on the other side, and this one doesn't seem to be opening. It's gonna last for quite a few minutes. Time probably seems a lot worse than it actually is because of how com uncomfortable everything is. But for the most part. It only goes for several moments. The door will eventually creak open. As it's unlocked by someone on the other side. And when the door opens, you can see another soldier. And also Lothar. The man that you saw the night before who was uncomfortably appraising all of the guests. The two men are standing in a large reception hall, also dimly lit by tapers, furnished with oddly delicate furniture. If anybody is interested in the furniture, because this is the first bit of, oh look, someone lives here, that you've really been able to see, I will allow a uh, intelligence plus etiquette roll if you're interested in, in any further information. Sure, I think Andrus would be uh, a little bit more worldly about these things, considering his lineage. Okay. Uh, I apologize, what was the role? Uh, the role is to see uh, if there's any details on the furnishing in the room that you're entering. Yeah, what role would that be? Uh, intelligence plus etiquette. Three successes. Just one. Just one. How about Aisha? Is she going to be uh, checking out the furnishing? Uh, yeah, I'll give it a try. I figure you're pretty well traveled. Uh, two successes. Okay, we'll go up in quality on the appraisal here. Um, first, Desmond, you'll just notice that this furnishing is built for looks 
not for any kind of sturdiness. It looks rather weak, rather frail. I would be afraid to even sit in it as a man of your stature. Understood. As for Aisha, you'll see... You've, you've noticed furnishings like this in more fancy homes. Um, they are a little bit more sturdy than they actually look, but for the most part, it is a, uh, it's a show of status more than it is anything else. And then as for Andrus, in your travels, you know the style of this furnishing specifically. And it's a, um, uh, it's, it's the fashion that's, that's the height of all intrigue in Venice, Italy right now. Hmm. Appropriate. Lothar mm. is giving the dirtiest look to Rodrigo. And all of you are going to hear him as he hisses a whispering echo at his subordinate. You're early. Rodrigo just removes his hat and kind of bows down and says, A thousand pardons, Stuart Lothor. And Lothor, without even another word, strikes Rodrigo across the face with a riding crop. Anybody standing that... Anyone standing close enough will actually get a small amount of blood splattered on them from the strike. When mm. Lothar does that, did you have something to say? Oh, no. Andrus doesn't say anything, but he does uh, get a little uh, expression of annoyance as some blood trickles onto his fine garments. Lothar looks back at Rodrigo and says, Bear keenly in mind the source of that blood. He then just snaps into a completely different persona. The, the mean monster that just struck the man who brought you here just kind of fades away. Stands straight, looks at you all, and says, Now enter. But looks back uh, down. Yes? Uh, I was going to say, Desmond looks livid. No. Oh. At that, at that violent display. Does Desmond do anything about it? No, he just looks absolutely pissed. <laughs> Lothar does he, like, out, does he look outwardly pissed? Huh? Is it, like, obvious that he's, like... Oh, no, I, I rolled a resolve composure to see how well he, like, holds his <laughs> tongue. Nice. And, like, he is biting his tongue back. He is actively, like, biting down on his lip, like, red in the face. Redder than usual. He's usually got a pretty... Between the, the, the forge burns and just being a heavy guy who drinks a lot, his face is usually red, but now it's, like, very evident he is not happy with that treatment. Mm. The, like, he's probably white-knuckling the hilt of his sword until he realizes that's what it... Like, he's doing that, and then he lets go. Hmm. The uh, Lothar stands to the side and allows the, the guests to all go past him. Um, do any of you hold back for any reason? Do you enter the room? How, do, how does that work for you? I walk past Lothar and I give him a side glance. And I, and I say to Desmond, good help is hard to find these days. I think Desmond just huffs. Like, like he doesn't even audibly, like he doesn't even coherently form words. He just huffs. Uh, Aisha will just sort of hide behind anyone that's bigger than her uh, as he as she walks past Lofa, and just keep her head down and keep moving. Okay. I, I think I think uh, Desmond's probably one of the last to finally walk through, as he's trying to regain his uh, his composure a little bit, and he just very tensely walks into the room being very 
I would, I'm not, I'm gonna, he's not even subtle. I think he's very obviously putting himself between Lothar and anyone else who's walking into the room mm -hmm. as he comes in. I think Lothar is probably just giving you, like, a dirty look as you're walking through then. The, uh, the last person through would be Rodrigo. But, again, with the riding crop, he slaps it onto his chest and stops him and says, as punishment, you'll not be partaking in tonight's bounty. You'll eat nothing but scraps. And he just barks, now go, and points the riding crap down the hall. And Rodrigo turns around, walks away, kind of sullen. He looks, he looks more beaten socially than anything else, and kind of looks over his shoulder at everybody. And then just keeps on going. When he's gone, one of the soldiers will slam the door shut and lock the inner door, locking you all inside. Lothar stares at the door for a while, almost as if he was watching Rodrigo walk down the hall. Then he turns, and again, he's got that jovial, but also snide way of speaking and says... Welcome to Lord Giovanni's mains. I have preparations to finish. You will wait here. And then he just leaves. Leaving the guests alone with the one soldier who locked the door. I say uh, as he walks away, try not to slap your servants too hard. I think he'll stop walking for a second and he doesn't look back. Almost like you can see him rolling that willpower dice. And then continues to walk on. So, you find yourself alone with the other guests and one soldier in a room that at least has some furnishing. How do you all spend the next few minutes? Is there like a fireplace or some kind of mantle or something? There is, but it's not on. The only light in this room is, again, coming from some taper candles that are in these kind of strange but well-made iron sconce holders. Uh, I think Desmond is going to just go grip the mantle of the fireplace <laughs> as hard as he can and just try to cool himself off. I didn't roll any successes on that resolve composure roll. It genuinely bothered him. <laughs> I'm not sure of your upcoming Desmond, but unfortunately, treatment like that is quite commonplace the higher in society you move to. As ugly as it is, try not to let it your is... composure get the best of you. Otherwise, you may end up as those unfortunate souls on the road his only crime was being punctual he did nothing wrong that is not the way that man sees it but nonetheless we are in no real position of power in that regard so it is best to try to stifle such feelings Lest you will cause much more turmoil for yourself. Oh, it is quite fun picking at that man. <laughs> I was so worried he was going to want to lick our hands again. I brought a glove specifically for that occasion. The rest of the guests, they seem to just be having hushed, whispered conversations or admiring the furnishing. Seeing observing just the scope of the room that you're all in. Uh, but they all seem to be uneased by what they've been experiencing. Is Paul here? Uh, Paul is not here. He is not one of the guests. Okay. okay. Um, I think Desmond will actually find Aisha and some of the other women if he can. Like, Yeah, you're all just in one room. Excuse me. 
Yes. If you see, he kind of like shifts uncomfortably uh, as he's not. He's not really sure how to talk to this to a group of women, really. Um, if something like last night were to bother you again, just stay close to me. That is very kind of you, but I have a feeling he's going to do what he wants to do. We are in his house, and she looks around and up at the really high ceilings. And uh, she'll try to map out if there are any exits whatsoever <laughs> other than the locked door, <laughs> a window perhaps. Also, has anyone else noticed that they keep locking doors? <laughs> mm-hmm. What are the doors? I apologize. During the description of the doors, uh, I was having connection issues, so I didn't hear. Like, are they just your traditional like wooden doors with? They're just very like, thick, like well fortified wooden doors. Okay. The hinges on the inside or the outside? I believe the hinges would all be on the. Uh, as you're walking in, I believe the outside door, the hinges would be on the inside. Um, but I believe that the hinges would be on the outside in the hall uh, okay. for this room. So, you said that Aisha was, was staring up at how tall the how tall the room was, correct? Mm -hmm. Can I get a wits and awareness from Aisha? Four successes. Yeah, four okay. Success. Uh, four successes. The light kind of plays tricks because of how tall this 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 area is, and where it looks like you may have seen like where the ceiling would start. You are going to start noticing that there's actually a balcony that looks down on this room and one of the things that you're going to notice that is on I on either side of the room are two guards with crossbows I sure will lean into Desmond a little bit and just say as she looks upwards have you ever visited a, uh, a fighting pit and she just like nods upwards for him to look up He'll turn and kind of look up. Oh, they're very difficult to miss once your attention is called to them. Because it kind of feels like we are fish in a barrel right now. I don't like this. We should not have come here. I don't care who invites us. Your conversation is going to be abruptly interrupted, probably stirringly, uh, by Lothar's voice as he's standing at the entrance of the room, smiling broadly. Come with me. I shall introduce you to your hosts. And he leads you through the house, walking through several more elegant furnished rooms, staffed with soldiers. And as you go deeper and deeper into this house, you're going to start hearing what sounds like music being played. And I'm not sure if all of you are going to know exactly what type of music this is. Um, I will allow if you want to, if you think that your character might have knowledge of other areas. Uh, I think that um, Andrus and... Uh, Aisha might have the best possibility of knowing this, um, but if you want to do a wits and etiquette roll, I can give you information. Um, I'll accept it from everybody, not just those two. So, ooh, okay. Just, I, a, just what was the roll? Uh, uh, I said wits plus etiquette, I believe. Yes. Yeah. It's a hurdy gurdy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> It's an electric guitar. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the sound is uh it's it's upbeat um but it's also kind of just melodic and just travels through the air and strangely enough uh, i didn't expect for desmond to catch on to this really but uh desmond and desmond and andres will will recognize it as being uh it, it it's an italian uh it's it's a music that's uh that's very popular in uh during the italian renaissance so it's it's music that's popular in italy right now well I can tell you one thing. They're definitely Italian. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's probably a good number of guests who are gonna chuckle at at that. Um, Lothar, as he walks through the house, he's he's going to get to a set of two incredibly ornate doors. And when he opens them up, the music is first going to get much louder. And what you all see in front of you is a dimly lit dining hall with <laughs> 13 other people sitting around a large table with an empty chair next to each of them. There's also several other what look like staff that are moving around the room. The, uh, the collection of people, just to let you all know, also, they vary quite differently you have very well dressed individually and then you also have slovenly some who are highly attractive and others who are appallingly ugly some of them seem local some of them seem foreign and as the door opens and you all walk in to see this a very short kind of pudgy but finely dressed man who's sitting at the head of the table is going to stand up he has five servants standing behind him. Two men, three women. And they all are just standing motionless against the wall as if they were statues. Lothar, walking in, takes his hat off, bows very deep, almost takes a knee before the assembled group and says, Lord Giovanni, lords and ladies, it is with surpassing pride that I present to you the fruits of my long search. Here are 13 of the purest samples in the land. The man at the head of the table looks at you all, says, Dear friends, I am Claudius Giovanni. I welcome you to La Bella Casa Giovanni. You are my guests, and while you are here, my home is your home. Now come, come. Join us. How do you handle your welcome? I... Actually, could I roll an etiquette to see what would be the best way to handle the situation? Absolutely. Intelligence etiquette would Can be I absolutely fine. Sure. Three. Okay. So Desmond and Aisha both got a one. This is just you trying not to say or do the wrong thing. But with everything that's going on, they don't really seem to be following much standard protocol. So knowing what to do is pretty much out the window. As for Andres, you see a very strange undertaking in front of you with your three successes this seems like it could go one of two ways this is either a party where rich people are showing off amazing specimens as lothar seems to be presenting or it could be a party where rich people are showing off people to make fun of them so, really, just being on your best manners is the best way you can probably work that out. So, either we're here for a show... Or you are or the we show. we are the show. Exactly. Before I make my way uh, forward, I turn back to Desmond and Aisha, and I, I tell them, under my un, in the lowest voice possible, I tell them, Be very, very careful. 
Do not let your emotions get the best of you. This is probably the most serious that Andres has sounded since this whole thing started. And I make my way to probably the uh, first open chair that is closest to Claudius Giovanni. You will be stopped before you go to walk, just to let you know. Uh, what do okay. um, what do Aisha and Desmond do? Uh, is anyone dancing with those music playing? No one's dancing yet. You seem to have walked in on conversation. Okay. I think she'll just uh, bide her time and just hang around with good posture and uh, try to <laughs> remove all the motion from her face okay. <laughs> when she's uh, anxious. But yeah, if people do begin to dance... That is something that she isn't too bad at, so she might join in. Okay. And Desmond? Desmond is mentally on the fence right now. There's part of him, his brain, that is screaming, something's not right, and I don't like this. And the other part of his brain that is telling him, just think about anything other than what's happening around you uh, so that you don't mess up. And... I think he rides that that kind of line for a minute and then is going to just kind of follow Andreas, uh, Andres's lead a little uh, and is going to try to think about the design for that brace for that uh, for Paul's leg just to keep his mind from to, to keep his mind busy so that he doesn't focus and get on something that makes him upset. Just keep your mind on work. <laughs> yeah. Understood. Yeah. Um, as you all start to take a step forward, because the other guests are going to start trying to get to where they believe they're supposed to be, servants step forward and offer you all a glass of wine while you stand in the entryway. Once everybody has their glasses, Claudius Giovanni says, let us toast to the most memorable meal of your lives. Do you all lift your glass? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I lift my glass. Claudius continues, here's to the finer things in life. And you're given time to drink. But at that I would point, like to sniff the wine first. Oh, by all means. Um, I was going to do the exact same thing. <laughs> okay, if anybody is suspicious about the wine, um, you can do a... Uh, I'll allow a wits plus investigation, if you'd like. Would you accept an, a wits or actually even a resolve plus survival? Smelling for poisonous berries or any, any herbal substances that would impact... I, one's mind. I will allow a resolve plus survival. That is a very clever roll. I like that. I rolled like trash, but... Uh, <laughs> wow. That is was a really good die pull and a really bad roll. That is disappointing. You can always roll I power. I, I was going to say, I think narratively it makes sense if Desmond... Desmond is actively putting forth effort right now. I think he's going to will power. Okay. You re-roll your three die. Just two successes in total, successes. man. That sucks. I've been there, bud. Yeah. That's rough. <laughs> it's like the, the Zuko meme. That's rough, buddy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, for those of you who are suspicious of your hosts and decide to smell your wine, it does smell, in fact, just like very fine, well-made wine. In fact, it's a it's a bit of a relief from what you had with breakfast. It does not taste watered down. It does not taste as if uh, it is starting to turn. It is very fresh and sweet. Is it better than the wine that I brought? Is it better than the wine that you brought? Um, I'm not going to say yes or no, but I will say that it is weighing heavy on your mind. 
whether it's better or not, or just the wine in general. Whether it's be- whether it's better or not. Ah, uh, okay. Like, like, man, did I actually uh, did I actually bring a good gift or not? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that might be something that is on your mind, but being able to yeah. tell hard to tell. Yeah, very hard to tell. <laughs> Mm. All right. And at that, as does anybody choose not to taste their wine? All the other guests are drinking. Uh, Desmond politely pretend like Desmond is going to let it touch his lips. He's not going to actually drink. Okay. He doesn't trust anything that's happening right now. He's very suspicious of everything and everyone. All I'm going to ask about the wine is if anybody feels that their character has finished their glass throughout this introduction, please let me know, and we will go ahead and see how well you handle that. Um, But the wine does taste very good, and as you all drink, or fake to drink, uh, the hosts will all rise to their feet and then come to you individually and introduce themselves. Giovanni All right. Giovanni says one more thing as the conversation turns to the guests and the hosts, and that is, we would know you better. Conversation is like fine wine. It enhances the appetite. So let us converse while we anticipate our dinner. And the three of you are going to be cornered by three of the hosts who would like to discuss things with you. First, Aisha. A short man who's dressed in very fine silks, um, very pomp, very colorful. Um, you would actually recognize the uh, the clothing style from being very similar to something that the more successful of uh, your family might dress in. Okay. Uh, he's wearing flashy gold jewelry and a coarse tunic and leggings, and he uh, he introduces himself as Lord Gabrin. Uh, sorry, was that Gavrin or Gabrin? Gabrin. It's G-A-B-R-I-N. Okay. He bows very low. He takes his hat off and puts it in the hand in the hand that he swings to his back. He will take your hand unless you stop him, and he will kiss your hand as he introduces himself. Uh, she won't stop him, and she'll do a deep curtsy uh, when he takes her hand. Andres, you are introduced to Lord Casimir. He's a portly man with a large white beard, and he's wearing a black robe with silver trim. He is, uh, he's very polite, but he also seems to be more interested in you than answering anything about himself. What is it you want to know? Oh, tell me everything. Where you're from. What you do. I hear that you are a, uh, a merchant of some interesting wares. Indeed. I travel as much as I can to uncover things of great mystery. Items of mysterious origins with interesting stories. Revealing truths. I come from nobility, but I have chosen a path more esoteric. More worldly, you could say. But as you can see, I still enjoy the finer things in life. He, uh, he gestures over to where he was sitting at the table, and he says, I would greatly love to have a conversation with you. But of course. Now, Desmond. 
Desmond, as all the guests are pairing off with the hosts, Lothar comes up to you and bows and said and says Master Desmond, I would greatly like to introduce to you to Matron Violetta. He gestures towards a hideous woman partly hidden under a thick gray leper's cloak and hood, wearing a full face mask with a ragged eye hole and a smelly wet spot in front of her mouth. Leprous scabs can be seen around her eyes. Lothar leads you to her, and she curtsies when you approach. Like, Desmond's kind of looks a little, like, worried. Uh, <laughs> As you should. Like, he doesn't have anything, like, he understands that, like, it's not people's fault that they, that they are lepers, but, like, he doesn't want to get sick either. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you seem naturally awkward around women, so this is like a double whammy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, he, he, she, when she curtsies, he, uh... You can hear he, bones crack when she curtsies at you. Oh, he, oh yeah. Cold, trying like, to... Like the last 15 seconds of microwave popcorn. Just... <laughs> oh. I think oh, it's only God. fair if he rolls, man. I think he needs to roll like a composure etiquette or something. Like, by all means, I, it's not a good roll for him, but I no, at least give not. him a shot. The composure <laughs> etiquette or composure <laughs> subterfuge? Let's go with right. composure. Oh, what do you think you would do? Would you try to lie your way through this, or would you try to social your way through this? He's trying to be polite about it. Then I would say composure etiquette. Which is not a good roll for you. It's only one success. It's better than the roll for subterfuge, though, I will say that. Damn, yeah. Shoddy. I uh, say you fell from heaven, but it looked like you crawled up from hell. <laughs> Do you climb trees? Because <laughs> it looks like you fell down and hit every ugly stick on the way to the ground. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Lord. Anti Riz. They just say all the wrong things. Uh, <laughs> anyway, she yeah, she curtsies and looks up at you, and you can just see that one eye, co just completely surrounded by just welts and crust and bruised skin, and that wet spot that just is releasing this scent of just pure what? refuse. Yeah, he is... <laughs> he's holding his breath. Uh, and he will attempt to... Uh, I'll, I'll let you... I, I mean, one success. He is holding it together, but not... It is not... It's very obvious he's not happy or comfortable here. Um, he returns a slight bow, but is still, like, attempting to hold his breath to the point where like if it gets to the point where he has to breathe he takes like a, a healthy step back looks kind of looks off at somebody else and then does so and then <laughs> kind of re-steps back into the to the space of conversation so there's just like this look of panic towards somebody behind you <laughs> yeah i think so i mean leprosy is not a thing that, leprosy is not the kind of thing you joke about no, right it's like, not it's not it's a life-ending disease, if not a socially destroy well, like destructive one. Yeah, especially back then. Now, yeah. when you when you look behind you, the only person who's not paired off with a host is Lothar, and he just has this smirk on his face, this almost like he's punishing you. Yeah, and he's greatly mm. enjoying it. He seems to be stopping to take a look and observe his handiwork. Is, is she dick? saying anything? Yeah, he's a total dick. I'm, I've got his number. <laughs> I'm coming for him. As she, as she stands and you can just hear every one of her vertebrae realign. <laughs> and she's still kind of haunched over. Looking like she should have some sort of 
walking stick or something, but she doesn't. It's 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 a sheer miracle she's not tipping forward. But uh, she will attempt anyway. It's one hundred percent up to you how you're going to act on this. But she's going to attempt to take your arm and come up to your side. Uh. I imagine he's wearing okay, he's I imagine he's wearing like his long sleeve shirt. Mm-hmm. Um <sighs> her tattered her tattered cloak covers most of her skin as well. Okay. But it is dirty. He yeah, he doesn't want to. Uh it's not the dirt and the grime, it's literally the the you know, oh, leprosy. Oh. That's that's the issue. Yeah, here. Lepros- <laughs> leprosy is leprosy is usually a red flag. Yeah. Um yeah. This is this is you know. I, I, I'm, you a, know I'm just, I'm just, this I'm is just gonna sw- roll with it. This is a swipe right moment. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, is it a red flag or a checkered flag? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, she's uh, she's going to attempt to slip her arm in yours as if you were an escort for her. Um, are you allowing this to happen? You'll forgive me <clears throat> if I. Uh... I don't. I don't particularly she'll, like touch. She's gonna cut you off when you say you'll forgive me if, and she'll go, "Oh no, there'll be no reason for that," and she's just going for it. Ah, uh, there's no way for him to pull back without making a show like a scene of it, is there? You can, by all means, do like a dexterity athletics to try to sidestep what's happening but it will be of it will be directly against her mm-hmm. uh yeah i think he's gonna i think just out of instinct he's going to reflexive oh that's awesome uh, dexterity ath- dexterity ath- athletics dexterity athletics and this will be the very first vampire role of the night uh, like of the game i'm excited a hey. Three Look successes. Three successes. Give me one second. I'm looking up her stuff. Yep, you're fine. Uh, the awkward uncomfortableness that Silent is displaying out of character is exactly what Desmond feels in character. <laughs> <laughs> this is That's a less than just, ideal situation. It is a very less than ideal situation. <laughs> this is like the worst pairing for you, man. Yeah, it's really bad. Um, I'm sure she's lovely. But, um, <laughs> yeah. sure, well, like, and, that's, scouts, you know? and that's what Desmond it, that it was the literal thought, first thought that went through his head was oh well I guess it was the second thought the first thought was are you kidding me the second thought was I'm sure she's a lovely woman but no <laughs> <laughs> okay here we go okay you got how many successes three this is one particular maiden that does not need to be sockless oh no oh my gosh you got four. <laughs> four successes. She is just so live, surprisingly, from seeing her. And she latches on to you, just almost as if she was about to go for a walk with a lover. Just slides her arm in between your arm and your body. And you can feel all the little hard nodules and bumps as her as her arm slides against yours just under two little layers of fabric between her cloak and your sleeve mm. i don't and so like she does that before he even finishes the sentence right yep yep she's so like there's it, no the need it just goes was, for it yeah the last thing he was saying was i hope you'll forgive me and then she does that i don't like touch <laughs> I don't like to be touched. <laughs> she literally just pats your arm with her like almost scaly hand and just goes, yeah. that, that's all right, sweetheart. <laughs> I, Desmond in a last ditch effort is like frantically eyeing for Andres. <laughs> <laughs> do I, do I see this happening? Oh my god. Um, let us uh, tell you what. We're, this is going to be interesting. I've never actually thrown a test like this before. 
I'm excited. Uh, we're going to do a three-way right. social challenge. Okay. Ooh. All right. Um, so what's going to happen is... Uh, Let's see. So Desmond's going to roll. Uh, what do you think an appropriate roll for Desmond would be? Uh, I honestly have no idea. Well, you're trying to get somebody's attention, correct? Yeah, it's like he, he is screaming, help me, with his face. <laughs> uh, um, I would say let's do charisma. And leadership? Leadership? Sure, we'll go with that. And then, um, <laughs> what about, uh, let's see, I think it would probably be wits and awareness for, um, for Andres. But you're competing against Lord Kasmar. Uh, so we're going to have him throw in two. Well, Do, uh, do non do nonverbal cues fall under the sign of animal kin by chance? <laughs> Not when you're talking Body to language. people. Yeah, I know. Oh my god! Two successes. Oh my god! I it's got crit, I got the first crit of the game. Awesome. Oh lord! Okay. That is a lot. Of successes. That's a lot of successes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Eight nine successes. So nine successes yeah. for Lord Casimir. Um, I don't think that, um, <laughs> I don't think Andres, uh, notices that you're in any kind of, uh, trouble. So does Casimir, like, uh, deliberately keep me from noticing? Is that what's happening? Casimir is just trying to keep your attention. He's not paying attention to anything that's happening in the room. He has you basically in a fascinating debate on authenticity versus value of relics. Perfect. Now, uh, he, he's got he's got your kryptonite. He's, <laughs> he, he's got you in that conversation. Oh, there were three different kindred that I was considering for uh, Andres. <laughs> since that was <laughs> since this one was supposed to be a surprise. And uh, I literally decided on this as we were starting to record. I had somebody else in mind, but I love this guy. Um, That's great. <laughs> so, yeah, nothing wrong with that. so I think the last thing that I really need to say for Desmond is that... Uh, <laughs> words. <laughs> Um, I think the last thing I actually have to say for Desmond is that um, you screwed, buddy. Matron Violetta looks up at you and says, "Let's go for a walk in the courtyard," and then starts Ooh. trying to lead you out of the room. I think he's still in the process of like testing, like if he can remove his arm from hers. She has an astonishing grip. That's what I was afraid of. Again, I'm happy to do tests if you really want to, but... Um, uh, yeah. They're both wearing clothes. He's, he, and he's just going to tell himself for just a few minutes, and then I'll burn the shirt. <laughs> Actually, no. I'm sorry. He's got kids. He can't do this. He has kids. Okay. Yeah, he's going to pull away. Okay. Like as funny as as funny as it would be for Silent to let him suffer through this, I I, I don't think he would. That's he fine. has kids to think about. I completely understand. That's that's com that's completely understandable. So you're trying to pull away. She's trying to pull yep. you out the door. So that's going to be the test. Okay. So we're thinking uh, like strength athletics here. Uh, probably strength athletics. Okay. She's gonna. I'm I gonna know I'm not gonna this, win, but I'm gonna count this as a grapple. So she's gonna be using brawl. Okay. Uh, and he is going to willpower this, even if it. I know oh narratively, it probably won't make a difference. Oh my god! Yeah, no, it's not gonna make a difference. Yeah, I okay. did roll well, but so you roll like it's gonna matter. You got than. one success. Nope, I got one, two, three, four, five successes. Five successes versus her. 
Oh, <laughs> damn lord. One, two, <laughs> three, four, five, three. six successes. Oh, wow. She just barely beat you, though. Yep, she barely yeah. beat you, but her, her, her frail form versus your blacksmith mass should not be able to do this, but she whisks you away out into the courtyard. On that, I I, I was gonna say I apologize. Uh huh. I think I think he tugs away like let go. <laughs> She like, I, I, he maybe makes a scene. I don't know if it matters, but he, he probably is not subtle about it. She is going to have the most unnerving crone like cackle as she takes you off into the darkness. I'm gonna go ahead and say that the others in the room are actually going to get broken from their conversation and look off in the direction as she's as her her rough cackle just kind of fades off down the hall so we all notice this happen yes all of you will notice if if there's like if she was she starts cackling and it's surprising like almost scary that he can't get free of her grip and he like yells, "Let go, leper!" And no one seems to do anything about it. <laughs> like, he's going to yell for Andres, for Andres. Oh, no. Andres. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Lord Casimir actually looks over at that display and then kind of playfully taps you on the shoulder and goes, "Looks like your friends shy around the ladies." <laughs> <laughs> and that just kind of loses himself in a little bit of laughter. Yes, he is. Seems to be a little awkward when it comes to that. Uh, I'm where, sure. Where is, where are they, where is uh, she taking him? I'm sure she'll bring him back in one piece. Oh, sh I'm not worried about her doing anything to him. I'm worried about him doing something to himself. <laughs> I don't think that'll be a problem. Mm. So, on that, who wants to go through the first harrowing? So you are sitting with Lord Casimir, and the last thing that you saw was your friend Desmond being dragged down the hall by an old woman in a leper's cloak. How are you feeling about that? I guess it depends on... How well Lord Casimir assuages my suspicions of something not right happening? Well, as he said, all all he said on the matter is, I'm sure she'll bring him back in one piece and just kind of laughs it off. Right. But does do does Andrus, like, is it possible for him to sense that something is actually not right? Or, or is it just something that he would just naturally kind of rub off well how about we I do a so. wits plus insight and see how that has been going how, how much have how's your drinking been first off uh i drank the wine glass um andrus was less suspicious about the wine being tampered with and more just kind of like ascertaining whether the wine was better than his okay um so he probably drank it because it was still pretty good okay um, so why don't we go ahead? He hasn't. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you good? I was gonna say, why don't we go ahead and do a stamina plus composure test and see how that oh, wine right. has affected you? Three successes. Three successes. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and say that you're holding it together pretty well. That one glass of wine was a not enough to get to you, which is kind of interesting because you actually do have pretty low stamina. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you're, you're, Absolutely. however, you're socially able to hold yourself together really well. So you're not going to be down traits for anything. Um, so if that's the case, right. you see everything that's happening around you. You want to see if there's anything uncomfortable or dangerous happening. Let's go ahead and do a wits plus insight to see if you can actually sense the danger. 
Ooh. Zero successes. Uh, no, everything nope. seems fine. Desmond's just not comfortable around women, apparently. Yeah, that tracks. It that does. Tracks. It does track. So I, I, I just wave it off and I say, ah, oh, I'm sure he will be fine, as you say. <laughs> now, Andres, you said your name was, correct? Yes. Andres Morsinai. Tell me. Tell me about what you do and why you do it. Ah, well, as I mentioned before, I come from a line of nobility through the family of Morsinai. And though the noble's life was something that was much aspired to by many people, it, uh, it grew very stale for me. My older sister was married off to the Hunyadi, and I sought more truths of the world. And so I took it upon myself, with the blessing of my family, to begin traveling the world as a merchant to uncover many mysteries, to assuage my curiosities. As you're going on with this explanation, he is staring at you directly in the eyes with, like, intense interest. And as you finish that last sentence, he leans in and he, lisp he whispers at you, but it's very loud, to the point where people who are around you, people in the next seat, could most likely hear what he says. Art thou knowing? I knoweth much. Are you wise? In the ways of the other world? He seems very interested. He's like fiddling with his hands and stuff. Like he's got his fingers are kind of rubbing up against each other as he stares into your eyes. Do you walk? I am but a mere. Yes. I am but a mere fledgling in the ways of the real truths of the world. Do you walk the left-hand path? Compared to what is expected of someone like me, I would say so. Do you know magic? Oh, no. Unfortunately, that is a truth that I have yet to ascertain. But it does intrigue me. So Which you is do... why I collect. You collect? Yes, a great many occult things. Uh, do you seek knowledge in the hidden arts? If that truth exists, then I seek it. I can show you. Can you? Yes, I can. Or are they merely words of somebody who thinks they know? He looks at you incredibly amused. The black arts are perverse and corrupting. But I'll show you. We walk across the room and turn left. I can show you down the hall. With no prying eyes. You can show me a real truth. Not a parlor trick. I can show you right now. And by all means. Prove this truth to me. He stands up. And he gestures for you to follow him. I do so. All right. He walks you down the hall and away from the party. You pass a couple of guards here and there, but he takes you upstairs to a higher level. Quite a bit of a higher level. I think you probably go up about five stories. And he takes you out onto a ledge. What do you think magic is? Ah, 
I do not have an answer for something like that. Of course, there is the general perception of this magic. Things that happen that could not possibly done. But true magic, who knows what that could be. With true magic, if I'm going to teach you, you have to trust me. Do you think that you could trust me? I followed you this far, didn't I? As long as you can show me the truth. Can I get you to roll an intelligence plus resolve? Two. Two? He rolled four. Before you realize what the hell just happened, you find yourself standing on the railing of the ledge, looking down into just utter blackness, unable to move, just staring down at your own death. You come to. You still can't move, but you are free to speak. You have no idea how you got up there. What do you no, think I'm of the hmm? I'm, I'm still standing in that same spot. You are standing on the railing of the ledge. On the balcony that you were just on. Staring down into... Effectively just... A crevice. Okay. And I can't move. You can't move as of yet. You could probably okay. fight this off. At least you can attempt. But uh, as you're standing there looking down and coming to realize that he just told you to stand up there. And you just did it without any thought for your own safety. What do you think of trust now, Andres? Is... is this trust? You climbed up there on your own. All I asked was that you do it, and you did. That seems like trust, does it not? Did I? Does it? What is this? You can come down, if you wish. And you do feel that strength coming back to your legs, allowing you to take your own action. I immediately step down from the ledge and back away. Looking very distraught and surprised and confused. <laughs> Lord Casimir is just sitting there with this big grin. The moonlight bouncing off his white beard. And he's like, and he just looks at you and he says, All I did was ask. And you climbed up there on your own. Was that trust? Or did I force you to do it? So would Andrus be self-aware enough to know if he was forced, or would it just feel like he just wanted to do it and when he asked? You remember kind of like, you remember doing it. You remember not having a second thought. You just remember him saying, stand on this railing, and you climbed up. It, it must have been thrust. You, you asked, and I did not... I did not give it a second thought. The dark arts I can just... be dangerous. I could ask you to step off that railing if I wanted to. What do you think of that, Andres? Would you? Would I? With, with everything against my being telling me that I cannot step over that ledge or I would die. Do you truly think that you could force me to do so? Make me think that I wanted to? Sure. 
should we test that? Prove it. He smiles at you. And he says, I would like you to stand on that railing again. Now. And I need you to roll another intelligence plus resolve. Oh, I'd do it. <laughs> and I got seven successes. What'd you get? Two? Yes. Not enough. <laughs> Before you even have a second thought, you've climbed back up onto that ledge. And you can see down... The wind is the wind is uncomfortably strong as you're standing up there. Now we're already on the stage, Andrus. I could tell you to take a step, and you would listen. How does that make you feel? Inflicted. How would I listen to such a request that would blatantly end me? Lift your left leg. And throw another intelligence plus resolve. Alright. I got three. I got five. There it is. You find yourself lifting your left leg as if you were about to take a step <laughs> off the ledge. Do you feel in control, Andrus? My mind tells me to do it, and yet my heart says this is this is wrong. He just sits there and smiles at you. You have no ability to put your leg back down. Andrus I would like you to take that, and before he can finish, a servant comes out and says, Dinner is served. Well, Andros, let's go in and join our friends. And he turns around and starts walking back inside. Do I gain the ability to move normally? Yep, he told you you could act on your own reconnaissance at this point. I uh, I lean backwards and essentially fall off the railing onto the the balcony. Cold, yeah, we cold on. flagstone that you're standing on. Yep, breathing heavily, uh, sweating, exasperated. That is truth. And you can just see Lord Casimir walking back in through the doors and heading towards the staircase. I uh, gather myself and uh, hurriedly follow him back. Okay. Trying to okay. compose myself. So, who wants to go next? Jen said she was going second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't like it when you laugh like that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like it when I laugh like that? No, it's terrifying. <laughs> uh, okay, here we are. All right, so... <laughs> you are sitting with a... Actually, he probably would not have taken you to sit yet. Lord Gabrin would be standing with you. And enjoying basically taking you in. Like he's observing what you're wearing. Um, you and he seem to have possibly common ancestry. At least mm -hmm. as far as like your people go. And he seems to just be doing circles around you with a crooked smile on his face while he's just casually flipping a small eating dagger back and forth between his hands. So, please, Aisha, 
Tell me about yes. you. Um, what would you like to know? No, tell me about your life. Tell me about your family, your your companion, your your heritage. Uh, well, I don't really tell many people, but <laughs> seeing as you're such a generous host, <clears throat> uh, I grew up in Romania. My family and I lived on an agricultural settlement, and uh, I have six siblings. Uh, we all worked the land together and took care of my parents when they were sick. Um, <clears throat> but when I was about seven years old, uh, the Turks came and we were all separated. So I ended up being taken to Greece. He, uh, he listens to everything that you have to say, and he seems like he has just this deep interest in all of it. And while you're talking, and he's going just deeper and deeper into just staring into your eyes as you speak, I need you to please roll a... Let's see, what is it? A composure plus wits. Okay. And that will be against him, so he will be rolling as well. Cool, five successes. Ooh, you might have a chance. Did not expect that. <laughs> you might have a chance. Uh, let's see. Yep, not beating that, am I? <laughs> seven. Well, you rolled five. He rolled seven. You actually rolled mm -hmm. fairly well. Um, he actually, yeah. as he begins saying things like, well, family is very important. It's, it's, he seems to be sympathizing with what you had said about your family being split up. But you don't really understand it, but like everybody else in the room just seems so much further away than they should be. You're not stand the room that you're in is big. But there's people standing around, there's people sitting at the table. The music seems to just be like fading off into the distance, like it's not really there anymore. And there's a slight chill in the air that doesn't really fit the atmosphere of the room that you're standing in. So you've survived all this time without your family. How? I learned to blend in, hmm. picked up languages, learned to be subservient. I'd like you to do me a favor. Yes, my lord? Don't call me Lord Gabrin. I don't need a title to give my life meaning. Do you think titles give life meaning? I suppose not. He is going to lose himself in a fit of pretty much uncomfortable laughter. And then he is going to make a very quick movement towards you. You might want to roll Dexterity Athletics. One success. Okay, I'm pretty sure he's got you. Oh, wow. Okay. Second critical. Uh, let's see. Four, five. So he's got five successes on your one. Before you realize what has happened, Gabrin has forced himself onto you and is kissing you very hard on the lips. It hurts. She definitely freezes up, but I think her... Uh fight or flight and survival instinct is kicking in and she's just <clears throat> trying to be in the moment and just play into whatever he wants. Oh, okay. He 
has heard you discuss your family, and he's asked questions. And when he pulls away from the kiss, and there's a small sting on your lip, he says, and what do you think of that mysterious substance dribbling down your chin, my friend? Do you think of it as your most intimate and most sacred possession? And you are bleeding. She takes a bit of the blood um, from her lip with her finger and just looks at it and kind of licks her lips and tries to wipe her face. And she just looks at the red liquid on her hands and just says, the blood is life. Of course it is sacred. He is going to wipe a small off uh, a small amount off your chin again he's going for this you have all the right to back away or stop him in any fashion <laughs> he and as he's speaking to you he rubs his fingers back and forth with your blood in between his fingers until it's just a sticky substance that he's collected We gypsies don't believe any mortal can own anything. We... And he kind of, like, smiles to himself and looks up. Humans merely borrow from the Earth's bounty. No one has superior claim to anything. Do you feel you need your blood? Yes. Well, what if I feel that I need your blood? She doesn't really know what to say. She just looks at him kind of confused and starts to back away from him. What if we all have need of your life's fluid? You said that Nobody has claim to anything on this land. But you bear claim to me? That's when you realize that that breeze that you feel, the distance of the music, the dimming of the chatter, you're outside in a courtyard. There's grass. There's a wall surrounding you. The moon is high up in the sky. You can still barely hear the music. You can see the people through the windows, just their silhouettes, dancing because of the candlelight. But you realize that you're not alone out here. You're standing there with Gabrin. But there's these birds that are starting to collect on the roof. There's snakes that are starting to come in from the shadows. You see wolves starting to make their way over the walls and they're starting to circle you. What if we all have need of that precious blood, Aisha? And you swear he has the eyes of the devil himself. What are you? He smiles and he has these horrific fangs. And then the animals start to close in. And they start to surround you. They start to bite at you. Uh, I think she begins to thrash as full panic sets in. Okay. And she's just saying, just don't touch me. Get away from me. Stop it. Make them stop it. Would you physically be trying to fight off these animals? As best you can, yes. All right. I need so many books. Um, <laughs> uh, I need another composure plus wits test against you as you're fighting them off. Uh, I'm going to willpower that one. Go for it. <laughs> So I got six successes. I got four. Okay. You feel yourself being overtaken by these animals and they start ripping into you. 
stealing every bit of blood that you have inside of your body. And just as you feel your light about to fade, you hear the words, dinner is served, and there's no animals around you. You're lying on the ground in the courtyard, and Gabrin is offering you a hand to help you off the ground. Silly girl, what are you doing down there? The spider crawls backwards away from him and clumsily gets herself to her feet. Okay. And she checks her hands to see if there's blood there. She wipes her face again. You don't checks have her a arms mark. For cuts. You don't have a mark on you. He stands there and he's <laughs> smiling and he gestures towards the open door that leads back into the dining room with all the other guests. Excuse me, it must be the wine. And she cleans her dress off and meekly begins to walk towards the door. You just hear him chuckling behind you as you walk in. So, you are being dragged down the hall into a small parlor where it's just you and Matron Violetta. I believe the last thing that you said was uh, that you didn't like to be touched. <laughs> uh, followed by let go of me, leper, and then Andres. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you screamed for Andres. When um, I yeah. think at that, I think at the realization that nobody is actually going to stop this, and he can't stop it himself. Mm -hmm. Like he wouldn't hit a woman. He definitely wouldn't hit a noble because that may that's that is death for his entire family. At least if he contracts leprosy, it's just that you know the end of his life. The kid, his sons can take over, but mm -hmm. I think he just defeated relents, just dragged into the other room. Yep, accepting as, it for what it is. As she's dragging you into the incredibly well decorated room where the only thing that doesn't really seem like it belongs is her. You hear her rough, gravelly voice say, all these lovely people with their lovely perfumes and lovely clothes are an abomination. Their prettiness is wretched and ugly to my eyes. Wouldn't you agree? And she stares up at you lovingly, resting her head on your shoulder. Yes, milady. When you are secure in that room and the door shuts, you don't really know who shut it. Possibly one of the soldiers that does seem to be one of their go their go their their jobs in the area is the guards they shut and lock doors. But once she has the privacy she wants, she'll lead you over to one of the overstuffed chairs and sit you down and she'll sit down across from you not letting go of your hand as it's stretched between the chairs i would tear out my eyes and peel off my skin to keep from looking like one of those preening dandies wouldn't you very disingenuously he just repeats himself yes my lady She leans closer towards you to the point where you would think that you would feel breath coming from that smelly wet spot in the center of her mask. But you don't. Beauty is a mask. A deadly mask. Your soul boils with ugly sores and deep festering wounds. Why hide them from the world? I don't know, milady. In shocking speed, she's right in front of you. And she is going to attempt to grip your face in her hand. How do you manage that? Uh, I think he's a little just taken back by the display of speed and doesn't 
he doesn't know what to do. Like, he's just... It's like choice paralysis. He's just lost for an answer. He doesn't know how to respond, how to reply, how to how to behave in this situation because he's so out of his element right now. That and all he can all he can think about is like if he contracts leprosy, what is he get like? How uh, he's he's already planning his own like ostracization from from his family and from the business and everything. Hmm. Well, you can feel her rough calluses on your face. You're not 100% sure, but you're not you're not sure that you feel five fingers or four. She might be missing one. You're not 100% on that. That smell that's coming from the wet spot on her mask. Part of you has been, like, calculating what the hell is that. Like, is that the smell of a leper? Is it the smell of a privy? Is it just death itself? It's just, it's such an, a strange scent that's coming off of her. It's so uncomfortable. But she is right in your face. And she says, mm. don't hide your disease. It's too lovely to disguise under a flawless face. Wear your vile inner self on the outside. And on that, I need you to roll a stamina. And if you have it, a cult. I'm not sure if you do. I don't believe you do. I do not. Then you can roll your stamina. One success. One success. Yep. Let's see. Let me see what she is rolling real quick. If it's what I think it is. What do you think it is? Out of curiosity. Uh, it. I think it's uh. Gonna be like Scorpion's Touch or something, mm. or worse. You got one success. Mm -hmm. She got five. Mm -hmm. <sighs> you can feel your flesh start to bubble and melt under her touch. The callus welts on her hands starting to sink deeper and deeper into your flesh. It doesn't seem to be harming you physically. Like, you don't feel pain, but you can smell burning flesh. When... What is your reaction to the whole thing that she's doing? He probably cries out like he's scared. <laughs> he's genuinely afraid. I think I think a part of him his his hand goes for the hilt of his sword. Even though he's not in a very good position that he could draw it, he's he's going for anything that he can think of. When you go to reach for your sword, her eye actually follows down to your hand. She's watching you do it. And then she goes to pull something from underneath her cloak. She lets go of your face. And she holds up a mirror in front of you. And you can see the damage that she's done. It's horrendous. The entire bottom part of your face, wherever her hand touched, has become a mass of welts and knots and just hanging flaps of skin. She seems pleased with herself. She's kind of... That old lady cackle that she has is, is ringing in the, in the background as she holds the mirror up to your face. I think in abject horror, he just swings the sword at her. Oh? Yeah. Right across, like, if, if she's standing in front of him in the chair, I think he just, across the midsection, swipes with the sword. Okay. 
go ahead and swing at Lady as at Matron Violetta. Which is apparently not what I thought it was, <laughs> as far as the powers go. Uh, this is a sizable die pool for Desmond. Yeah, her too. One, two, three, four, five. And I think it's only fitting in this scene as terrified as he is to Willpower. I don't know if you have to. I think you might have beaten her. I think he does anyways. <laughs> he... <laughs> okay, so how many? I just think he does anyway. Uh, oh. One, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven. Well, I rolled four. I'm going to go ahead and willpower as well. <laughs> Only because you got that much higher. Oh, and she did not get any on her willpower. So. Yay. Uh, I don't I, know what the damage value you would say of like a traditional, like well-crafted longsword is, but. I'm going to go ahead and say plus two margin. Okay. Um, let me double check to see if she has. Nope, no fortitude. Okay. So what damage did you do? What is it? Three plus two? You did five damage uh, to her. Yep. Superficial to her, though. Yeah. So she actually took, like, two. Yeah. So but I think I think as he's, she holds the mirror up, he, and just, like, realizing just in abject fear and horror, he is... He draws the sword and just lets out a like war cry of pain and terror mm -hmm. uh, as he slashes out and begins to charge. Like he's going to continue to move forward out of the chair and drive, like pushing her back to drive the sword through her into a like, wall. He's, he's not. <laughs> he's done. Yeah, yeah. You hear the glass. That's his. That's his physical intention, at least. Yeah. You hear the glass shatter to the ground as the mirror hits the stone and shatters into a million pieces you yell as the blade sinks deep into her abdomen and you push forward impaling her against the wall and she what you hear is this loud horrific scream you realize is actually her laughing at you while this is happening and you look down and see that, yes, you did in fact cleave into her, but the sword itself is becoming pitted. And her blood is eating through your blade. And she's just laughing in your face. What have you done to me? <laughs> what, are, what kind of monster? This place is cursed. He's just, he is, he's freaking out, dude. She looks you in the eyes with that one scabby orb and pulls herself closer to you on the blade. You can hear her bones scratching the steel as she pulls herself closer. And she goes to grab your head, and you could swear that she's trying to go in for a kiss. <laughs> Not if I can help it. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we do another test? Yes, please. Okay. She is trying to kiss you. What are you going to do? I am trying to take the blade that is kind of center mass of her abdomen and push it out through the side of her, like, through her, toward her hip, and out the side of her body. Out the side, Just you going put it in, like or total... you're trying to cut her in half? No, no, Yeah, he's effectively trying to, like, bisect her at the waist. Okay. Like, turn the blade in the wound and push uh, toward, uh, effectively toward her, like, hip. Severing her in half. Okay. Well, she got four. <laughs> Holy crap. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you better hope that I can... <laughs> you better hope that I can like get this willpower well, because you might need a new sire. 
<laughs> That's fine. If, if it happens oh that way, God. it happens that way. Okay. Um. <laughs> so she takes two, just two superficial on a tie. Yeah, she takes or another. Beat me. Yeah. Hold on. What did you roll? Uh, one, two, three, four, f one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Kindred win ties. You tied with her. Okay. So, <laughs> so as you go to yank the sword through to bisect her, it gets stuck against her spine. And she presses that wet, smelly cloth against your mouth. And she kisses mm. you deep. And just as all this is happening, a calm voice calls from the now open door on the other side of the room. Dinner is served. And she pulls herself off your blade, taps you on the face twice and says, let's go have dinner. And starts sauntering off back to the uh, dining hall. Leaving you there, deformed, and with a blade that has now snapped in half due to whatever was inside of her that ate away at it. There's... I, I'm going to ask you for some insight for, for in, in character here. Okay. Desmond is a hell of a good smith. Mm -hmm. this weapon is effectively useless as far as combat would go uh, it's shorter <laughs> I would say you okay. wouldn't get as much range out of it I'd say it's snapped That's in fine. half at the blade you could still probably use it okay I didn't know if it was like broke off at the hilt or like no. halfway up the blade. Halfway up the blade. Um, the so part it's, like that, a, it's more like a, a machete in like chop. You you know chop with it, not so much slice with it. Yeah, you could chop or with it. You could probably you could probably still stab with it. It's just it's pitted and frail. Okay. So yeah. As soon as she turns his back, he just brings it down on her shoulder. Okay. You're trying to do I, that. I think. It, I I think in in this scenario. Okay, he is a trapped. He is trapped, first mm -hmm. of all. He is terrified, and whatever this thing is, it's some kind of demon, as far as he's concerned. All right. Well, I just rolled for her. She rolled six. Oh, dear. Oh, no. You got two. Yeah. You go to swing it down. And just before it cleaves into her shoulder, which you would most likely assume would be a killing blow, but everything that you've seen now, you probably have your doubts. Yeah. She reaches up with her right hand and clasps the blade. Looks back over her shoulder in almost a seductive still frightening but seductive manner and says we're expected darling come along and starts dragging you behind her by the sword i do need a wits is it wits no it's a composure plus resolve check from you okay one success one success I'm just double checking. You might beat this. You got one success? Yeah. Not her best role. She has three success. She is dominating you to follow behind her. What is this what does it feel like for a mortal to be dominated? You are moving beyond your own control you feel your legs moving you want to go the other way she doesn't have rationalize 
You're not doing this on your own free will. You feel yourself being puppeted down the hallway and returning to the dining area. <laughs> the three of you, you would all re-enter the dining area around the same time. You have a very strange mix. Some of the people who that you came here with are sitting at the table and they look terrified. Some of them are crying. Some of them are just blank and staring off into nothing. One of them is face down where his plate is going to be, still breathing, but unconscious. Mariana is standing next to Claudius, looking completely terrified. How would you say that Andrus looks when he re-enters the room? Exasperated, a little bit pale of skin, and he is uh, dabbing himself with a handkerchief to kind of uh, soak up all the sweat that he had released during that ordeal. Um, he looks like he's trying to catch his breath and compose himself. You can tell that underneath he is pretty disturbed. Lord Kashmir <clears throat> just leads you back to the table and has you sit down next to him at the table. What about Aisha? Aisha is visibly trembling. Uh, she's looking around frantically. And she keeps kind of like double taking, like checking that things are real. And she keeps pinching herself. With everything that Aisha has gone through, there's this feeling of double take, almost like a whiplash. You go to do something, but then you find yourself five feet over to the left. You. You get lost very easily in where you should be standing. And at one point where you can see Gabrin walking back to the table and motioning over for you to sit next to him, would you go willingly or no? No. No? No, she wouldn't. As you go to get another seat, and you're meticulous, you grab the chair... You pull it out, you go to sit down, and when you look up down the table, you realize that you are sitting right next to Gabrin. And he's just sitting there smiling at you with those fangs. Now. Ash. Hmm? I was going to say, she, she just looks down and uh, a, a cold sweat is uh, visible on her brow. Mm -hmm. And Desmond. You get led out of a hallway back towards the table. A broken sword in your hand being held by Miss... Uh, keep wanting to call her Mistress. Uh... Matron Violetta dragging you behind as if you were a child and leading you over to a seat. You don't have a choice. You are doing what she says, and that's that. How does Desmond look to everybody as you walk back into the room? Uh, you tell me how he looks. I don't know what his physical, the, the, the exact nature of what his physical appearance is, but beyond it is utter fear. Just. In the face of every potential threat, like veiled or just weird thing that has happened in, since they all kind of come together, in the face of, like, you know, Lothar and the weirdness and everything. He was a pretty stoic, unmoving individual. 
his eyes are bloodshot with absolute terror right now. He is sobbing. And he can't... He wants to cry out. But he... It's like he can't get the words out. Like something is physically <laughs> stopping him from speaking. And the... Do you want to interject as far as the surface level? Do you want to given given how I described it to you, do you want to talk about it yourself or would you like me to put that on? Uh I, I think I've got I think I've got a description for it. Okay. The the light burns that he had up the left side of his face initially were like it was just like he'd been licked or kissed by flame. It now looks like from the bottom left half of his face starting at where his the left side of his uh, yeah the left side of his face uh, the beard is gone uh, and it looks like flames have just completely creeped up and like third degree burns all over his face does that sound fairly apt to the the skin is bubbled and blistered and twisted beyond anything beyond what it was before. That sounds about right. Matron Violetta, who is leading, who you all can assume by the clothes that he's wearing, Desmond, looks like someone has taken an axe to her abdomen. She has a very large swath cut out of her side. Her robes that she wears are shredded and stained in a dark red. But as she walks closer to the table, everyone can see the knotted twisted boilous leprous flesh beginning to knit itself back together on its own she's going to mm -hmm. lead desmond to the chair next to where she was sitting and as she sits him down like a mother would with a child she's going to lean over and kiss him on the top of the head with that wet spot on the front of her mask and sit back down at the table. Tears are strolling down his face, but he can't, he cannot audibly sob right now. And that's how we're leaving off tonight.